Hello, looks like I'm live. Just uh, say hello to everyone who's joining us. Is um, Basically, my presentation is going to be on Zen and the art of approaching wildlife. I'd like to thank the Polar Tourism Guides Association for letting me give this presentation. And just to remind us, it's going to be a whole series of these. And next week is Gerard Baker's going to be hosting a panel discussing um, LB, L, I think right, LGBT issues and inclusion. And also remember, last week we had Dr. Tom Holt's amazing presentation on penguin conservation, which you can catch up on on the website. A bit of background on me is I've um, been mad about wildlife since I was a little kid, watching programs by Jacques Cousteau, David Attenborough, and actually my favorite TV naturalist, if anyone from Britain, was Tony Soper who's actually also one of the pioneer naturalists on expedition cruise ships. And um, when I was a person in my early teens, I really got into bird watching and probably that's really helped hone my skills as a naturalist. I first started, um, went to Antarctica in 95, but regularly been visiting polar regions since 2004 and also on cruise ships in tropical and temperate seas. And in contrast to that, I've been a guide in the rainforest of southeast Peru, and the lowland rainforest has to be the most challenging place to be a guide to actually observe and find wildlife. And I said, I'll be talking about how to approach wildlife. But to start with, what I want to talk about is when we're at sea, is the way to actually enhance some observations in certain areas, for example, when we're crossing the continental slope, the drop off of what we may be able to encounter. And the first example I'd like to give is we we're on a trip around Svalbard, going in a clockwise direction, left Longyearbyen. We had blue whales to start with and towards the end of the trip is the conditions were really good as we came around southern Spitsbergen. So we decided in the morning to go whale watching to the drop off and then head into uh, Belsund for a landing in the afternoon. So we, uh, going up the edge of the drop-off, we would zigzag from the shallows to about the 500 meter mark, zigzagging backs and forwards. And we often get some great humpback whale encounters in the shallow areas, the fin whales with white beaked dolphins on the drop-off. And the reason we went out to 500 meters was whether we'd be able to pick up any more blue whales. For some reason, the 500 meter mark is a good place to see them. So it's basically covering all our bets. On this occasion, I think we didn't get any extra blue whales, but since we saw them early in the trip, it was OK. So we're thinking we had a bit of time. Shall we just head into Belsund? But talking to the captain, it's so calm. I said, let's go further out. So we went further out to deeper water. I was hoping perhaps we might see a northern bottom as well. Didn't see any. However, at about 900 meter condor, we came across some sperm whales. And what I realized is um, quite often when exploring that area in the past, we covered the top part of the drop off, but we hadn't gone further out. It's only by going further out, we'd get the sperm whales. And I mentioned, of course, that chance of seeing northern bottom as well. And for me, beat whales are an amazing group considered for many years to be uh, quite rare but it's often expedition cruise ships have been finding them and what my argument is it's that they're rarely observed and give an example here of this off Spitsbergen quite often the ships don't get into these areas other times on a sea passage the ships may be crossing the drop off but maybe early morning, late evening, or we're doing lectures so people aren't looking. Or I know where we are, I want to look, but the conditions aren't right. Even if there's a slight swell, it's very difficult to see big twelves. And then of course, if it's flat calm, nine times out of 10, these amazing deep diving animals are probably on the dive. And we, we just heard recently the Cuvius big twelves smashed the two hour record, three hours, 42 minutes, incredible. So I've always tried to be on the bridge when we're crossing a drop off in calm conditions. And I've seen Southern and Northern bottlenose whales, um, Arno's beaked whales. And last year was coming back from the Commander Islands to Kamchatka. 
is um, I knew we'd be coming up to the um, continental slope, coming back up to the continent. And I think it was mid-morning we'd be reaching there. The Commander Islands had been such an amazing time. We're all rather tired. So I thought, oh, I catch up on an hour's sleep and go off to the bridge. Well, I overslept and dashed up onto the bridge and we're already starting to come up the slope. And hadn't been on the bridge for very long. And about two o'clock in the distance, I saw some cetacean activity. And at first, a good long way off, I thought, are oh, these orcas? So we changed the direction of the ship. And when we got closer, it turned out they were bears, beat whales. We had an amazing encounter. And what I realized is if I'd overslept for another 20 minutes, we would have missed them. And that got me thinking is um, when we are exploring, for example, the pack ice edge for polar bears, is we often have a watch system someone on the bridge looking for the bears. I think when you're going through at sea and it's calm conditions and you're going across an area where it's interesting seabed features, it'd be good to have this watch rotor to not just chance of seeing beaked whales, but other species as well. The other thing is in these sort of locations, it's enhancing our times when we're in that area. And another example I can give from a few years ago, we were sailing from the peninsula to South Georgia via the South Orkneys along this Scotia arc. And so we had a group of whale watching enthusiasts on board led by someone, some people may know, you know called, a guy called Dylan Walker. And what we got the captain to do was we we're going along the edge of the drop off. But what we tried to persuade him to do sometimes if we we're a bit further out where it starts to deepen, we could look further out into the really deep sea and back to the shallows to see where there was any activity. My analogy here is if you're driving along a road along an escarpment, you've got more chance of seeing, for example, birds of prey compared if you're three miles out in the flat or three miles on the plateau. And so basically enhancing our chances of coming across something. And this concept actually started with um, the ferries going across the Bay of Biscay is they, the commercial ferries, they've got to be at the port at a certain time, but on calmer debt, on calmer crossings, they had more time. So what they would tend to do is speed up to start with till they got to the drop off and they would spend a longer time. And like this, um, basically is, um, they've really increased the number of sightings of big 12s. And I think this is a thing is the Polar Tourism Guides Association, we could all get involved with, is actually enhancing our times in these sort of areas in calm conditions. And it's not just about um, when you're going along one of these drop-offs, is if you're coming, for example, into the uh, South Shetlands and you, you're going, the route is towards your first landing destination, so you're aiming for a certain strait. As you're approaching the continental slope, by going up on the bridge and looking at the chart, by perhaps um, altering the course five nautical miles to east or west, you could go right over a sea mount. And an example I can give here is um, we were leaving Cape Horn and going straight down to the Antarctic Circle. So we're doing more of a southeast passage, dead calm day. And as we we're approaching, well, I knew roughly the drop off was we had strap tooth well. When I dashed up onto the bridge, I found out you were on the drop off, but there was like a ridge coming back up. It's rather like a sort of um, underwater Cape Horn. So overall, this thing of what we call is um, talking to Dylan Walker is um, when we were doing this crossing to South Georgia. We also um, looking at the um, charts. These were paper charts on the bridge. We noticed at one point there was this interesting sea mount about 40 nautical miles ahead, but it was about 10 nautical miles off our course. So talking to the captain, he tried to work it out and said, no, it's just a bit too far off. He said, it's a shame if you had um, told me last night, it would have been great work for the navigation officer. We could have zigzagged to these points. And from talking to Dylan, we thought it'd be a great idea to try and push the idea of you could call it Operation Seamount and basically target those areas going from there may be a sea canyon or a sea mount. And I do think this is a thing is we should be encouraging and it'd be amazing to see what records we get coming back. Now, 
What I want to go on to now is the main point of this presentation, Zen and the Art of Wildlife Approaches, and how to approach wildlife. In many ways, it's going to be more relevant to the Arctic, where wildlife is more wary, but it's also applicable to Antarctica. And um, I do recommend watching um, Tom Holt's presentation. And he came up with a very good point that we're often more slow in our approach in the Arctic, where sometimes in the Antarctic, we know there's a penguin colony over there, there's a penguin highway here, keep to the guidelines. But in other areas, is um, people may be moving around quicker and just to be observant, there may be a penguin resting on the ground. And the other thing I find in um, Antarctica, particularly the end of the season, people coming back to the landing to get on the zodiacs, and suddenly there's a whole group of curious gentle penguins around. And everyone's saying, come on, everyone, last zodiac, everyone's been hurried along, and people may be um, at a distance from the gentle penguins, but because they're walking quickly towards the gentle penguins, they become apprehensive. Yet if, as you're coming along, if you make it very clear you're trying to find your way through the penguins they accept it and this is rather like um if you're walking through a park and everyone's having a picnic and you're just trying to find your way through so overall again what it is it, it's it's very much how we are behaving now with this approach is well, watches, for example, are very aware. We all are aware of um, slowing down when we're approaching wildlife. But I find quite often the mistake bird watchers make is they see a bird in the distance and they get their binoculars out and look. And they decide, oh, well, we better come in cautiously. And they look again and walk closer and stop and look again. They're coming in stealthily like a predator. There's a very good chance that animals that bird's going to fly off the animal's going to move away when i first became aware of this I was actually as a guide in the rainforest in peru this place has had the biggest diver is a um, huge number of diversity of birds and if i went out with a bird watching group we'd see lots of birds but we never saw monkeys but if i was going out with a general group and we're heading back to the lodge people are very happy and chatting making lots of noise come around the corner and we have a whole group of monkeys staring down at us been curious and this is when i realized is um with a when you're approaching wildlife there are three ways i think is they are apprehensive they can be nervous and of course directly they start going that way being apprehensive and nervous they may then decide if it's a bird fly away or animals move away and it's very difficult to um once they're nervous is to get their confidence back. The middle way is an animal or a bird is tolerating us, but ideally we want them, once they become aware of us, to accept us, be relaxed with our group, and even become curious, like this example I told you with the monkeys. So the example I want to give is it, it can do it with various Arctic animals, but Northeast Greenland with muskox. You um, with muskox, sometimes even the cruise ship coming down the fjord, the muskox are wary and they start moving off. Other times we get the zodiacs in the water, the muskox, you can see them in the surrounding grasslands, tundra, and they move off. But if they're lucky, we get ashore and the muskox are still feeding, they are tolerating us. They're not moving away, but they're still not sure of our presence. What I've sometimes done in these occasions is follow a valley so we're hidden till we come to a viewpoint. But quite often I found this didn't work. Sometimes you got to that viewpoint and when you appeared, you suddenly startled the muskox. Or when you got to that viewpoint, what well, I found what usually happened, you got there, you suddenly found the muskox have moved on. Right from the start, they were aware we were trying to sneak up on them because obviously normally they are also adapted to um, being hunted by wolves. So what I started to do was I don't hide from the muskox at all with my group. And if the muskox are still quite a long way off, I never head straight towards the muskox. I might decide to head off to the left or the right. 
And two terms I want to use here is um, when people are doing bat surveys, they use these two terms. If a um, bat is commuting, it's going from A to B, or it's foraging in the area. So what I am in to do, I'm like on a, I'm on a route, I'm commuting from A to B to one side of the muskox. I can be watching the muskox to see if they're wary, and if I decide that no, the way they're reacting, we're not getting any closer. I want to leave them in peace. But from the muskox point of view, they can see we're not heading directly towards them. We're going to one side and hopefully they, they're tolerant of this. Then as I get closer, I start to use the foraging technique. I start, because they're still you know, such a fair way off, I still want to keep walking. I'll do a zigzag course across the tundra. I stop at various places to point out the flowers and perhaps there's the remains of a muskox and some of the geology and maybe some other birds around and gradually approach the muskox, keeping an eye on them all the time and hopefully by acting like a group of foraging animals as our group rather than predators trying to sneak up on us, on them, they accept our approach. Um, then we'll be aiming for a viewpoint, hopefully not the closest viewpoint, but a midway viewpoint to view them and get the guest a chance to have their first sort of closer view of the muskox. And this is, I find, when things can go wrong. Quite often, as a group comes to a viewpoint, everyone spreads out in a line. And it's like um, a Zulu horde about to invade. And this is often when an animal is spooked. I've also found the same if you're approaching a lake with wildfowl like geese and perhaps some red-throated divers on it and they're accepting us, they're tolerant of us and suddenly people spread out in a line and we spook the wildlife. So what I instruct my group to do is I want them to come into a tight group and in addition to that it's pointless coming into a tight group if suddenly all at once we stare at the muskox. So I say to people, I know this sounds a bit daft, you can look at the muskox or even take pictures of the muskox, but keep looking in different directions and at the muskox like this. So my argument is, is if the muskox have been watching us, we're like we're foraging, moving up towards them, then finally we come to a place where we're resting. And when we get to that spot, we're not intently looking at the muskox. By this time, hopefully, I realise is um, the muskox are tolerant of us and hopefully they're moving towards accepting us and being relaxed with us approaching them. So then I stress to my group what we're going to do next. I will point to the next viewpoint I aim to get to, which is probably going to be our closest viewpoint to the muskox. And I said, as we're going to go up there, we're going to continue to zigzag up. We're probably going to stop a lot more. And occasionally I'm going to say lost wallet. And I want everyone as we're walking along going back is to look down at the ground really as if you've lost a wallet or look up like you're lost. So we're really emphasizing this sort of foraging behavior. And I can be looking at the muskox and if obviously they're becoming wary, I may decide to back off. But hopefully they will be accepting us. The other thing I've told the group, as we're going up to this final viewpoint, when we get there, it's very important for us to get into this group once more and look in different directions, but also to do what I term the grandstand. We get into the tight group and what it is perhaps the photographers of big lenses can be kneeling down and then the short people, medium sized people, and tallest people, in the back so we don't have people moving around everywhere so by doing this gradual approach the lost wallet and ending up in this grandstand looking in different directions and at the muskox hopefully they accept us on one occasion i can remember i was looking different directions and then at the muskox there were two muskox looking at our group with intent and i was a bit worried are they apprehensive and suddenly they started walking towards us and the whole herd came closer. They had gone right in the other, they'd become, they accepted us, they relaxed and they became curious. And finally, they went back to feeding and a sort of angle fed and went past us. And we had amazing views of those muskox just by the right 
approach. And with that, what I call the grandstand, often find this really works in, if you, if you get a curious Arctic fox, it can come up and come around our group, where sometimes is, um, if there's people spread out, of the people one so I can't see the foxes so they everyone's moving around trying to um get a good view and obviously people moving around you may disturb everything I see as the question come up is advice to spread out as a line to create a horizon rather than a clump I think like all these things with the zen it, it's a, it, it's um it depends on the reaction of the wildlife. But I tended to find if you go out in the long line, you look like you're sort of coming down to invade them. And I think it's this sort of, this whole, this whole approach of getting, accepting us. The other thing I find with the, uh, this grandstand approach with, um, I often use this when we're close to a walrus haul out. And bizarrely, you sometimes get the curious walrus coming in as they're coming into the hall late and they're coming on the shore and they come to check us out. And I'm absolutely convinced if we're in a more compact group with these people kneeling down, some people in different positions, I think one of the reasons they come around to look at us in a very odd way, we look like a haul out of humans. So I do think it's very interesting the, the way um, we approach wildlife. Now I want to come to uh, zodiacs. Now again, as Zodiac drivers, we're all aware of approaching wildlife. But I've realized sometimes we, if you set off on a Zodiac cruise and everyone says, right, oh, there's a seal on ice at two o'clock in the distance, and we head off in that general direction. And then when we get closer, we slow down. But it might be because at first we're just heading in that direction. The seal may become aware of our presence. And at first the Zodiacs are heading straight towards the seal. It may become, it may accept us, but it may become more apprehensive and going down that line of being wary, it may slip into the water. So what I tend to do, even from a distance, remember I said earlier about foraging and then um, commuting, I will say, right, I'm going to go on this route on one side. So I'm not gonna aim straight towards the seal. And as I come closer, I may then start coming closer, or I might decide to go straight past on this passage. If I do that, I will slow down. I will tell my passengers on the side closest to the seals to kneel down so the other passengers get a view over the top. I don't want the passengers standing up. And what I will not do on that first pass, I will not stop. I will slowly go past. And my analogy here is. You have a footpath, people walking down the footpath, and there's a bird on a bush, quite happily watching all the people walking past. You suddenly get a group of bird watchers walking along, and they suddenly look, oh, there's that bird. They look up, and that bird disappears off and goes into the bush. What I do if I'm walking along a path and I see a bird in a bush, I might slow down and stop, but I look in the other direction. What's going to happen is a very good chance that bird's going to look across to see what you're looking at, and then I can gradually turn around and look at that bird. So again, what I say is in the zodiacs initially, don't go straight towards something to one side. And if you are planning to continue along, don't stop, but just slow down. There's other times when um, it may be, say, a black leg kitty wakes on a buggy bit, and I'll gradually approach them, watching their behaviour. Are they all alert to my zodiac? Or kitty wakes tend to be fairly laid back. Are they preening and just relaxed? to see how close I can get. And what I sometimes do is um, if there's the wind or the current, it can, I can drift past. What's important here, the kitchenweights immediately realize, just like other bits of ice, this Zodiac with these people in them are drifting past in the ice. And what I tend to do, I'll put the engine into neutral, but I won't switch it off. The reason for that, as we're drifting past, if we're getting a bit too close and I can see the kitty weight starting to become alert, I can put it into reverse and back off without turning the engine on. And quite often like this, you get amazing encounters because they just accept the Zodiac floating past. So again, it's assessing each um, situation and the way, the way the Zodiac's behaving. The other thing is anticipating where you're going. If you see a Antarctic minky well, 
is that they, they appear you know, two or three times. You can see the direction it's going in and with the guidelines, you can gradually come in from the side, but they're quite fast moving. So what I might do is see if it's going through areas of ice, I can see where it's going and I can, in a very roundabout way, I can get ahead and just wait to see if the MinQL comes past where my Zodiac is. So I'm anticipating and slowing down and assessing things on um, as things are happening. And a good example here is humpback whales. Oh, the number of humpbacks and this last season was incredible. And often you get feeding groups in different areas. I might get a closer group over on one side, but they're not spending very much time on the surface. And I often will look for a group which is spending more time at the surface. There might be some um, younger animals which pop up earlier and start playing around. And so I'll see where they're heading towards and assess the situation. And I might actually head off. There might be an iceberg I can go over and investigate and basically wait for the whales to come to us. It may be 10 minutes or so, but just again, anticipating where they're going. And if in the right position, as they come along, it might be that they um, surface to a distance, one side of the zodiac, under the zodiac, and next time they come up on the other side, they're, they're aware of us. And while I explained to my group then that they weren't bothered by us, but they're not interested in us, we're gonna leave them alone, and let them go on their way. Other times, if you're very lucky, at some point they decide to come up right next to the zodiacs. You get a great encounter and they continue on their way. And if you're very lucky, and it happened on my last cruise, there was this group with a very inquisitive well, which was spy hopping, flipper slapping. It popped up close to us and it came across and we had an amazing encounter. So just anticipating where you are, whether you can approach or whether you should back off. There's an another example I can give is um, if you're zooming along in the zodiacs and suddenly get a whole group of porpoising penguins close to the zodiac, quite often I'll tilt up the engine to get the, it's like the vapor trail on the, on the aircraft, just get that stream of bubbles more obvious. And sometimes it's great. Sometimes the penguins are just not interested. Other times they come across and interact with the Zodiac and porpoise around us. And the guests have an amazing encounter with porpoising penguins. Now with um, approaching seabirds, what I find here is, um, and it's particularly from working in UK waters, is um, black guillemots are, um, very, they're often very curious and they come right up to the zodiacs. Puffins have relaxed ashore, but they're very wary at sea. So again, if I get a group of puffins at sea, I never take the zodiac straight towards them. I might do, you know, come in a certain, you know, on one side of the puffins. As I come in, I gradually zigzag in. Now, what I found was coming in, there were they're tolerating us that sometimes they're more relaxed. But as I'm coming in on this zigzag, as I'm coming around, there's one point where the zodiac is pointing directly at the puffins. I noticed when I was doing this, these puffins were tolerating us and I could see they were becoming apprehensive because they're wondering whether the zodiac was going to be heading towards them. So what I started doing as I'm approaching the puffins and I'm going to turn, instead of turning towards the puffins, I turn the other way. And that's what I always do now when I'm approaching a group of birds on the water. I'm zigzagging, coming closer, but my zodiac turns away. And of course, as I'm turning away and backing, if I realize they are more wary, I can then back off. I remember a couple of occasions doing this with um, puffins. On the final approach, as I go past, and again, I don't stop, I slowly go past with my group, is as we've gone past, the puffins have actually come swimming in to investigate us. So instead of being apprehensive, they've gone from tolerant to relaxed to becoming curious. Then the next example I'd like to give is um, coming to a group of feeding seabirds. And what is, as I come in, obviously on one side, and again, what I will do, I'll bring up the prop a bit to disturb the water. Sometimes the seabirds aren't interested. 
but other times if there's the plankton in the water suddenly all the seabirds move across to where the zodiac is and suddenly we end up in the middle of the feeding frenzy of birds and it's an amazing experience then and then i change my behavior or rather the behavior of the zodiac and i say to the passengers okay is what i suggest kneeling down on each side what i'm going to do now i'm going to do fallow rope impressions and i gradually circle the zodiac like a fallow rope or sabine's goals do this as well and um in the end you often get all the birds coming right up to us and it's an amazing encounter now with the fallow ropes is um i first learned about this their, their curiosity is, is um walking along the coast seeing some red fallow ropes in the mid say on the other side of the lake sometimes i'd get into the water and i would walk around in a little circle and sometimes the fallow ropes would come fly over and they would land right next to me and start spinning around and feeding and for me this is some of the most special wildlife encounters when wildlife decides to have an encounter with you other times when I've done these fallow rope impressions, sometimes it's been completely clear water. The fallow ropes have flown across. They've started spinning around looking. Then they look up at me, they look down, look at me as if to say, there's no food here and they fly off again. So it's a real interesting um, experience is I want to, the final thing I want to talk about before I open out to questions is um, with this, uh, when you have this uh, real special, close approach with curious animals it's sometimes there are sometimes dilemmas how we get the balance right that we're they're approaching us with making sure the guests aren't getting too close um there was a question about the zodiac's drive what it is is it's it's almost like it, it's it's sort of it's almost spinning i'm almost spinning my zodiac around like a fallow rope would do they almost circle at some I'm doing basic the zodiac's doing a fallow rope impersonation but the last things i want to talk about is these really amazing close encounters sometimes in the arctic it's things like uh, arctic foxes can come up to our group but it's mainly um in antarctica i mean gentle penguin chicks at the end of the season when they decide to approach us or blue-eyed shags Oh, blue eyed shags and they can be so curious when they're about to fledge or they're just flying and they land on a zodiac they are in, in is um yeah so i'm just seeing some of the questions for coming up later but examples i want to see where there's sometimes dilemmas first example is uh, king penguins in south georgia what i like to do is if they've got flags on flagpoles i make make a route to a flagpole and say right this is the observation area it's the right sort of distance from the edge of the colony. There's a very good chance those really inquisitive, hairy chicks will come across for an encounter. And more passengers come in, and suddenly you end up with lots of chicks and lots of passengers, and you think, oh, we be careful here. Perhaps we should back off. My argument is, is that the right approach? We've created this observation area by moving further back. If the chicks keep following us down if an opportunistic giant petrel or skewer turns up and starts chasing the penguins they've got further to run back to the edge of the colony and go into their huddle so my option would be is you keep the observation area but actually you control the numbers you only have so many people approaching and enjoying that encounter and then backing off. And also it means as one of the guides, I can be a keep an eye out for some, for example, fursils. And this example of having an observation area, another example I can think of is our Nico Harbour, for those who know Nico Harbour, the continental landing and the gentle penguin colony. If it's accessible quite often on the, on the side on the glacial side of the colony people can sit down on the snow or in the rocks and just soak up the atmosphere and look for a carving and also the chicks can come in for an encounter but sometimes fine if people are spread all the way down to the shore is basically is there the space for penguins to get through but normally my main concern then is if there's a passenger 
closer to the shore, having an amazing encounter with the penguin chick. And us, but they're a bit close to the shoreline. And we know with Nico Harbour, with the carvings and the potential tsunami wave, is there's these people we need to control. And this is sometimes it's better to have this observation area. Another example where there can be a dilemma is um, with elephant seals, with wieners. And well, first of all, any elephant seals is sometimes it's a bigger elephant seal going down to the beach. It's given space. What I always stress to people is give space. Or I find, sometimes find a whole group of passengers say, all looking at a, a, a penguin, for example, and they're on an inner line. And from coming from London, it's like some tourists have come out of the underground and they've come up, seen this amazing view, and they're all just standing there. And there's no way through for me. This idea of creating space for the wildlife to come through. But normally, I'd say with a wiener, they want to come to us. And of course, they can come closer, and then you're like, oh, we better back off. But right, if the, the wiener keeps coming, we're going to exhaust the wiener. So why don't let it just relax in front of us and people can get an encounter? In contrast, what could happen is um, there's wiener scattered around. We can keep our distance away from them, but there's quite a few fursuals around. Then my concern is if people start having some really nice encounters with wieners, we've got fursuals around, they may not be aware of them sneaking up behind them. So in this case, we're actually going to go around this group of um, wiener elephant seals. And um, with any close encounter, what I would say, what I think is very important at the recap is to say, you know, explain why there was this close encounter. Still remember the guidelines, the distances from wildlife, cautionary approach, and also to stress if they've taken a picture of themselves next to one of these curious animals and they're sharing it on social media, please explain what was going on. You just didn't walk right up to that animal. Now the last two things I'll, I want to talk about before answering some of the questions is and um, it's with um, first of all fur seals and then walrus is the different um, the way you react if you have females with pups. First of all I mean fur seals I think we could have a whole workshop because there's lots of issues with uh, fur seals and um, obviously they can be potentially dangerous situations. But I find is um, at, towards the end of the season when the, the male fur seals are more relaxed is when they come ashore, yeah, yes, they do mock charges. And sometimes the idea keep 50 meters away, but don't back off and sometimes hold up your hands and then they will back off. But there's other times when the female is coming ashore and she just wants to go up to a pup. The people are aware, they get into a group. And perhaps as they get in the group, there's a gap the, the, the female sees between the passengers and they go, go between that gap. And some of the passengers panic because this seal is coming towards them. They make a lot of noise and the first seal is getting agitated because it wants to come through. And this is where we need to control things more. And a good example here is at Stromness, where you get people coming down from the Shackleton Walk and you get the people going up to the waterfall and then we get lots of females coming ashore and that's where it's good to have someone on duty being the equivalent of the lollipop, lollipop lady with a lollipop on the zebra crossing controlling things either stopping passengers or leading them through so again it's assessing the 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 um, situation with walrus Svalbard oh, since I've started the, the increase in walrus is incredible. I've already mentioned the, the idea of the curious walrus coming to the um, beach. The other thing happens in the Zodiac, you sometimes get a group of, again, curious walrus, not apprehensive, they're interested in the Zodiacs, they're in control of the situation, and very typical, a lot of seals, a bit like bullocks in the field, they all come up towards the Zodiac, and then they're not sure, and they go away, and they come back and go back some forwards. What I've noticed recently, you're starting to get a few females with older pups at, for example, Toro Neset. The first time this happened, the group was coming towards the Zodiacs and suddenly one animal came hurtling out back into the group and all the group backed off and then they started approaching us again. The second time I saw it, I realized what was happening. They're all curious. None of them were wary of the Zodiacs, but the pup was so curious it was getting ahead of mum. 
and she was just nervous. It's rather like her mother with the child walking on the pavement and the child's getting too close to the road. So in those case, cases, because you've got mothers, if pups, you need to be more cautious and wary and backing off. And also using that example ashore with water sort of haul out. Let's say it's all well controlled. People in the long line will look at the walrus. There's some people closer to the shore. Suddenly a walrus comes in for a close encounter. Everyone looks around and some of the people up here realize they all go running down. The walrus in a haul out suddenly all look up to see what's going on. Now, of course, in most cases, the, they realize they see the other walrus, so they accept it and being walrus, they relax. But mind, with our behavior, it could startle the walrus because this is just a reaction you'd have if there are polar bears around. And if there's a female with a pup, this idea of tolerating us, relax with us, apprehensive and panicking. I, 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 again, I think it's unlikely, but if the group is in a, what I call the grandstand, I have more control over the group. So it's just an example and sometimes individual situations, how to assess things. So just to say, before answering questions, um, Operation Seamount, when crossing, really interesting, like the um, drop-off. Never approach wildlife directly. If you're passing, just slow down and don't stop. And remember this foraging technique to come in and the lost wallet. And also when you get into the group, the real danger of suddenly ruining it all by suddenly all staring and often going in a big long line. I find it's good to get into this compact group so it looks like you're just a group relaxing. So some of the questions is um, advice how to respond when it wants to get closer and you feel how comfortable. With them. Well, my example there, this whole thing of this Zen approach, we may be a long way off and I just sense that we're still a long way off, but the way the wildlife react, you know, sorry, we're not getting close. And people say, oh, we're far and we're, not, we're um, still a long way off. But I say no. So again, it depends on the um, situation. The other thing is to interest in other wildlife. Oh, thank you very much. Is everyone wants to see walruses, everybody wants to see polar bears. But what is often off the radar of a lot of um, guests and even sometimes staff who've just started is a little orc colony. They are stunning. To me, if they are just as amazing if you can get up to one, polar bears, as, as walrus, etc. Of course, they're challenging places. Quite often, the sea conditions you can't get ashore, and there's quite a few little colonies where the expedition leader will be very nervous of going ashore because they may be hidden places for polar bears. But sometimes it's good to get ashore. Other examples that Gravneset is, is often emphasis on um, doing the beach swim because it's great to do this polar swim on the beach. You get it over with rather than having to do it from the side of the ship. But my goodness, it's a really calm day. You can have some of the people ashore, but it's really good to go the other side of the bay because there's an amazing little colony, which you can see from the Zodiacs. Another example is um, leaving Smirenberg. It may be in the evening. Quite often the ship will go past Fugelsongen, which is a stunning little colony, and the ship can get quite close and it may be worthwhile for people to get closer. So certainly people who know me is I have a real passion for little orcs and um, I used to work with Frank Todd is and the late Frank Todd and certainly he really gave it to his exhibition leader if they didn't visit a little orc colony. Oh, interesting is how do you handle 10 or more zodiacs in the water with staff all wanting to give their guests the best experience. That can be quite a challenge. I think when there's lots of humpbacks in the um, different humpbacks, you can choose different locations to go to. I think probably the, the main challenge here is um, uh, polar bears. I mean, obviously you can do the round robin with, uh, with groups doing this, you can come in on the courses approach, but obviously if it's, um, I don't know, it's like an ivory goal and it, there's, a lot of zodiacs. It, it is a challenge. What it might be here, I think, if we're all as though we're all aware of each other, we realise there's some other zodiacs coming in. We might say, okay, actually, it happened this year with emperor penguins. Is we had to um, actually go back to the ship and bring people back. 
And so what I was saying is, OK, we're not going to be here for very long. There's others wanting to view this the penguin is. So I'm going to go past some people can get some pictures and enjoy it. Then we move on. So perhaps that's the way. But I do agree, sometimes there is a real issue if you've got lots of uh, zodiacs. Is, um, closer is, um, I think I've answered most of the questions I've got here. It says official well watching guidelines are quite rigid and structured from a long way off. And it is important as we're gra it might, if we're gradually approaching wide wells, it's gradually slowing down the approach. And quite often from many years well watching, I think sometimes is it even coming even slower and assessing the, uh, the, the situation so the wells have a chance to, to react. And obviously what I stressed at the beginning, if it's a fast group of wells, I don't like to chase them. Not for me to chase them, pursue them, follow them. So this is where I might see where they're going, and I might take a very roundabout route and get to a point and wait for them. And what I sometimes do there, when they're still a long way off, but heading towards us, I might initially, before they get close, I might rev up the engine or tap the ground, just so they know where the zodiac is. And then, of course, when they get closer, I will turn off the engine. And I think again, it's it's assessing each um, situation. I mean, a good example, I think, with the ship and fin whales. Fin whales are very fast moving. And sometimes I found in the, um, the fin whales been right next to the bow of the ship. It's been coming up. It's, um, and as you approach, first of all, as you approach a fin whale in the ship, if it starts to turn away, it's not interested, the ship should back off. But I've had a couple of times with fin whales where they've been right next to the ship, and I've got an amazing picture of a fin whale right in front of the bow, it looks like the ship was about to run over the fin whale. And I explained to the group at recap that wasn't the case. The fin whale was to one side, and I think is probably the fish it was trying to feed on was in front, and it was using the um, our ship to help concentrate the food, and then it zoomed in front of the ship and fed and went on its way. It's that's its reaction. Is amazing. So again, it's assessing each situation and particularly fast moving species. It's also the same, I think, if you get, um, it's more relevant to places like the Falklands, if you've got bow riding dolphins is assessing the situation as they come in. And sometimes they like the Zodiacs going uh, uh, faster. The other thing I do find actually with this technique of bringing up the prop is leopard seals are sometimes inquisitive. On one occasion, it's one of those cruises where we haven't seen many leopard seals on this one Zodiac cruise towards the end, we had a really amazing encounter and um, then I realized, oh, you know, I'm, I, sometimes I'm tight, so I'm getting back to the ship. And I thought we'd better head back. And as we head back, I realized the leopard seal was following us. I put up the prop of it and the leopard seal followed us all the way back to the ship and the other passengers had a lovely encounter with the leopard seal. Great, is recommend don't leave your engine idling. Yes, what I said there was in with the wells coming in, if they're further away, I'll have it on. Then when you get closer, I'll switch it off. What I was talking about, if I'm drifting past some birds, whatever, or some seals on the ice, is if the current suddenly changes and takes me towards them, I don't want to bump into the ice. And what I don't want to do is start the engine. So by having it, in neutral, it's usually fairly quiet. So it's, that's where I think it's the better approach. With, I'd say it always depends on the, the, the situation. So I think I've answered everything. Is I don't know if there's any, any other questions. Is um, I hope you've enjoyed the um, presentation. And basically, just to stress the idea of the Zen attitude is when wildlife becomes aware of your presence, at first they're tolerating you. They may become apprehensive and you don't want them to go further down that line. You want to bring them the other way to being um, accepting your presence and relaxed and even becoming curious. And as I said, when they're curious, again, you have to 
assess the individual situation. And what I stressed again, I think sometimes when you get really nice close encounters, it's very important to stress at recap what's going on and still follow the guidelines. And basic, I think for everyone, when they're short, is slowing down and being very cautious walking around just in case they haven't noticed that sleeping penguin or seal. So, so I think that's everything. So I'd like to say thank you. And remember, as you can still watch Tom Holt's amazing um, presentation on penguin conservation and all the amazing stuff done with cameras. It's amazing what's available to all of, all of, all of us. And this is one of the things PDGA is um, promoting. And next, next week, again, is um, Gerard Baker will be hosting the panel on LGBT issues and inclusion in the industry. Thank you.